the judgment. That's what leads to conflict. And when there's no mechanism for resolving conflicting subjective judgments, the only way is through a fight. So the choice is, for Hobbes, I mean, to boil it down, the choice is either we resolve conflict, we resolve conflicting desires by fighting, or by what? Or by substituting some judgment for all of our judgments so that we wind up sharing the same judgment about what's valuable. The only way to do that is by appointing someone whose judgment will stand for all of ours. That's what the sovereign is. That's kind of thing like you were saying, how the sovereign is the one person who doesn't give up their rights to their little person. So what if it's like an assembly right. of the sovereign? Good. You theoretically say that each member of the assembly gives up their rights to the other member of the, members of the assemblies and such that they're all giving up rights to each other so that no one member of the assembly stands by them. That is kind of what happens. That's right. So I'm still delaying this also. Uh, how we make sense of the difference between one natural person, one natural human being, and assembly standing for, uh, for the sovereign. Okay. So um, so. Last point here, I mean, we'll talk about this more just in a second. Um, but the story that I just told you about all of us sort of running around in the state of nature as a threat to one another, and then we all agree conditionally to transfer our right of nature to somebody else on the condition that everybody else does so as well, and we therefore achieve the sovereignty. There's actually a, a variation on this. It's only a slight variation. We'll talk about this later on also. But what I just described to you, where everybody is a natural human being, relatively equal to one another, therefore a threat to one another, and therefore we agree with one another to transfer our right of nature to somebody, become sovereign. That's what Hobbes calls sovereignty by institution. We institute a sovereign. He also talks about a variation on this called sovereignty by acquisition. This is what he says at the bottom of 109. He says, the attaining to this sovereign power is by two ways. One, by natural force, as when a man maketh his children submit themselves and their children to his government, his rule, as being able to destroy them if they refuse, or by war, subdueth his enemies to his will, giving them their lives on that condition. Okay, that's going to be sovereignty by acquisition. The other is the one we just talked about. The other is when men agree amongst themselves to submit to some man or assembly of men voluntarily on confidence to be protected by him against all, all others in the hopes that they'll be protected. This latter may be called a political commonwealth or commonwealth by institution, the former by acquisition, and I'm going to start talking about commonwealth by institution, sovereign and conflict by institution. So, um, a nice question that we will uh, take up maybe next class is how can there ever be sovereignty by acquisition if Hobbes is assuming that we're all more or less equal? Okay, but now we're going to talk about sovereignty by institution, which is sort of the main case that we're describing here. Um, and although chapter 18 is called Of the Rights of Sovereigns by Institution, I want to tell you that as long as we have a, this is a bit misleading, because as long as we have a sovereign, whether the sovereignty came about by institution or by acquisition, what we get with sovereignty is the same. So sovereignty, the rights of the sovereign, the nature of sovereignty is independent of whether it came about through institution or through acquisition. So I'll say that again. Even though the title of this chapter is of the rights of sovereigns by institutions, 
the rights of sovereigns by acquisition are exactly the same. And that's what we're going to be talking about now. Okay, so um, uh, the, only, I'll put it this way. the only difference between sovereignty by institution and by acquisition, you might say, are the conditions out of which the sovereignty emerges, not what comes about from it. Okay. Um, so the existence, Hobbes says, the existence of a sovereign is both necessary and sufficient for there to be a conflict. This is what there has to be in order for us to get out of the state of nature. There has to be a sovereign. And Hobbes has very strong requirements in order for there to be a true sovereign. So short of these requirements, short of these demands, we don't actually have a sovereign, and we maybe technically remain in the state of nature. Now things may be on the surface relatively stable. We might not be fighting all the time, but unless we have a genuine sovereign, there's not the right kind of stability. There's always a threat of degeneration into a state of um, fight and manifestation of the state of war. Okay, um, so look over on, um, well, actually, um, look at the bottom of 110. He says, so, sorry, so this is now trying to answer the question of um, the why Hobbes insists on these very strong conditions. Um, the bottom of the 110, he says, um, this first part, um, <coughs> so we saw that we authorize the sovereign, we have to authorize the sovereign to judge what's good and valuable, what ends with the and to act in my name. Um, and I suggested this before, now I'll say it. For Hobbes, the transfer of our right of nature to the sovereign is irrevocable and unconditional. So for sure, it's unconditional. I already said that. The sovereign is not party to a covenant at all. He doesn't, he doesn't agree to do anything. The transfer is uh, without condition. Sorry, without condition from the point of view of the sovereign. It's conditional on everybody else doing so as well. But the sovereign, the sovereign can't do anything that would violate our agreement because the sovereign doesn't make it. Um, okay, so why? So these are the these are the strong conditions that I just mentioned, and Hobbes now provides a few arguments as to why uh, why this is required. And, so, sorry, let me just put these two thoughts together. If we, Hobbes' claim is that if we try to have conditional sovereignty or try to have revocable sovereignty, we wouldn't have sovereignty at all. It might seem as though things are stable temporarily, but below the surface it remains a state of war. Even though there might not be fighting right at the moment. Okay, so these are so these are the strong conditions that have to be satisfied in order to have sovereign at all. That's that's what I was trying to say. And now we gotta see why I was saying. Okay. Um, well, so the first point is that. We can't choose a new sovereign. Um, 
actually, sorry, let me, let me make one other point first. Um, and that is that on the picture of sovereignty by institution, we're all running around in the state of nature, all insecure and a threat to one another, nobody so much more powerful, nobody so much weaker, nobody's able to do what they want very well because of the insecurity, and we uh, read Leviathan, realize that the problem is we're all relying on our own judgment. We realize that it, we all could do better in terms of our own self-interest if we were to give up our right of nature, our right to judge for ourselves on the condition that everybody else does so as well. So we all sit around the campfire and decide we're going to transfer, all of us will transfer our right of nature to that guy over there who will become sovereign, who will judge for us what's valuable and what's to be done, and we will accept that judgment instead of relying on our own judgment, which is a problem, and act as that sovereign requires us to act. That's the picture. It doesn't matter much who we choose. What matters is we choose somebody to unify our different judgments and desires. The problem, the source of the whole problem here, is the fact that we're relying on our own diverse and conflicting desires. So the solution is to substitute one desire, one person's judgment, for everybody's. And we won't be in conflict anymore. And it doesn't matter much who we choose, as long as we're unified. Okay, so you might think that sitting around the campfire, we take a vote and decide, okay, that guy over there is going to be our sovereign. And that picture is kind of right. But do not think that this means Hobbes is in favor of democracy. Because once we've identified the sovereign, we have no more rights against that sovereign. Once we transfer our right of nature to that individual, we cannot decide to take it back, our right of nature. We cannot vote for a new person to be sovereign if we don't have to. So there is a kind of, maybe some pictures, vote as to who initially will be instituted as a sovereign. But once that happens, all bets are off. We no longer have that right to choose the sovereign because we've transferred it. Okay, so that's the kind of thing Hobbes is saying in the bottom 110 to 111, where if we're bound to a sovereign, if we have a sovereign, we can't choose a new one because we don't have that right anymore. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, you can just one, one question. Sorry. Oh, you kind of starting to explain it. I just didn't understand like, what the sovereign actually has for like, the credentials, like how it actually chosen. Doesn't matter. But what if like, he becomes sovereign and he or she um, like, messes up? Yeah. Right. Then we've made a bad mistake but we no longer have a right to do anything about it. We transfer their right. So, um, so, sorry, so, um, why, so the, nat the ne next natural question is, so why don't we transfer condition on the condition that the sovereign not mess up? So we say to the sovereign, we'll all give you our right of nature, but you need to promise to do a good job protecting us. And if you violate that covenant, we get our rights back. Hobbes says that's impossible. So we'll see why next time.